Okay, right. So, um, like you said, I will be talking today about my work in sort of um, applying te machine learning techniques to systems that we would like to control in feedback and wondering about robustness guarantees there. And specifically today, I'm gonna to focus on the case of perception-based control. Um, this is joint work with a bunch of my colleagues at Berkeley, um, Aurelia, Nikolai, Ben, Rohan, and Vicky, um, without whom some of the cool videos I'm gonna show would not exist. Oops. Uh, all right, so. Um, machine learning is a promising tool for processing complex information. That's why people keep talking about it. That's why everybody is excited about it. Some of the successes are in areas like speech to text or um, image recognition, object detection, and in translation. And what these areas have in common is that the inputs are sort of this weird uh, mess of data that may not be clear how to process otherwise. And so learning provides something um, really powerful where you can take data sets and get something useful. And so as a result, um, we're excited about using this tool to actually act on the complex information about the world that we sense. So one example is in games, video games, chess. Um, AlphaGo was one that people got really excited about, where in this case, the information is given by the board and the positions on the board. Um, and learning was a really important part of understanding how to value different board configurations or different moves. Um, similarly, we're also pushing in areas like robotics to apply image recognition uh, capabilities to sort of control things in real time. Uh, this was an open AI example of manipulating a cube with a hand. I think it took maybe like the equivalent of millions of years to train, but in the end there were some pretty cool uh, videos, right? Uh, but it's not necessarily a reliable procedure to do. So we have in the past, like I think two years now, had a few fatalities from cars driving in autonomous mode, including uh, Uber and Tesla, both um, have suffered from problems here. Um, as well as like maybe examples that are more abstract, uh, systems like YouTube are criticized for how they might radicalize individuals walk watching them. And what these systems have in common is that there are learned components in feedback with the real world. So what is challenging here and why is this unreliable still? Um, one is that Using machine learning in this way, we're observing the world partially. Like, we don't have full state observation. We don't have a Markov decision process in general. We have some kind of partially observed Markov decision process. There's also a distribution shift. Once you use a learned uh, component to act on the world, you're changing the world around you and thus changing the data that will be put back into that learned component. Um, and finally, both of these things sort of contribute to a lack of robustness. Um, when you don't have state observation, robustness is trickier, and when distributions are changing, robustness is harder to guarantee. So that's going to be the motivation for my talk today, and everything I'm going to say from here on out will be sort of targeted at this example of sort of racing from pixels. So the goal here is to drive around an arbitrary track as fast as possible using just the dashboard mounted camera. Um, and so this is illustrative because in this situation we're going to be pushing against performance limits, um, as we get faster and faster, and that will let us understand why uh, driving from a camera or using learned components for the camera might fail. Um, add the caveat that I'll say is this is not totally realistic. If you want to make a car that uh, drives around racetracks, you should probably have a lot more sensors, there's a lot more tuning you can do, there's a lot of careful work that has been done in robotics. Um, so this is not purely realistic. Um, and the way that I'll talk about it though is well, we'll use models for control, physics. So let's say that we do know something about the world. We do understand how the world changes. Um, so we understand the dynamics, but we will use learning for perception. So in this case, um, although there is a lot of good work in visual odometry, let's suppose that we would like a slightly more general approach where we don't have to characterize cameras or the environment very formally. Um, we just wanna learn that from data. Um, and so this approach can be successful. So this is a teaser. I'll show a video like this again at the end of the talk and explain it in more detail. But this is an example of a one-tenth size RC car driving around sort of this track defined by this rope um, at pretty high speed. So this is what the dashboard camera view looks like. Um, and there are a few more sensors we're using for control here. Um, but the main sort of uh, sensor for position comes from doing a sort of localization method on these images. Um, and these are features that the camera's picking out. Um, so it can be successful, it can be really useful, but um, it can also fail. So sometimes when you drive the car, uh, we might 
drive around this very small office space if we don't get to rent the Wozniak lounge in time. Um, and then sometimes the car will crash. Sometimes it will hit objects and not actually act like we would like it to. And so the question is, why does it do this? And I'll answer that today um, by framing the problem in a more simplified setting than reality, but something that can hopefully illustrate what's going on. So I'm going to start with uh, setting up this problem, this simplified problem, and show how it relates to output feedback optimal control. So um, many tasks that we would like a system to do can be modeled as an optimal control task. So for example, if we have a car that we would like to move over to that point over there where the star is, um, and we know how the car moves in reaction to some input, so this is f equals ma, and then we can write the derivative of velocity as acceleration, and the derivative of position as velocity, so know our model from physics. Um, then I can write out some optimization problem that describes my desire for the car to move sort of quickly, but without too much input force to the star over there. So uh, this is sort of stylized, but we have some minimizing, minimization of a cost function subject to some known dynamics here. Um, and sometimes this problem is not easy. Sometimes we're in situations where like, maybe these things aren't as clear, but a lot of the time we know the models, we have a good proxy for the cost, and so this is easy when states are directly observed. Um, what happens in sort of the driving example that I just showed or a lot of other things is that we don't observe the states directly, um, but we instead have some observation function. Um, so this cost and these dynamics are the same as before. I'm just writing them a little bit more generally. But uh, what's different is that z is some high dimensional observation from the world um, and that we need to design a controller that acts on z not on x, so on observation, not on state. Um, and so there, obviously this is a problem that exists in the world. Engineers have done a lot of cool things. Um, one traditional approach relies on physical modeling um, to sort of reduce the sense in complexity by doing state estimation. And here you would do some kind of maybe extended common filter, which would take into account the dynamics and this sort of generating procedure. So G is like this appearance map, which maps a state to an image. So it's generally pretty complex pretty hard to specify. I don't work in graphics, but I know that that's an entire field of research. So um, this EKF is sort of um, tries to reduce that complexity um, and estimate an underlying state. And then we can just do control on the underlying state as if we had state observation. Um, and this is successful. Lots of systems work this way. But the modeling part might be kind of annoying, or maybe we want to use sensors that we don't have good characterizations for yet, and we want to do some automatic calibration or something. Um, at the very other end of the spectrum is this end-to-end -end approach, where instead of having to worry about how we would estimate a state carefully, we can just use data to say, well, in the end of the day, the procedure that I showed here is ultimately deciding the control action based on the series of images that I observed, for example. So I can do that directly, right? And maybe if I have enough data, that's something that would be successful. Um, I said already what I'm going to talk about here, which is going to be something in the middle, some sort of hybrid approach where we keep our optimal control problem and just change this observation from z, which is some complex high dimensional thing, to y, which is going to be much simpler, maybe a linear function of the state. Um, so to make this more concrete, uh, let's say this is the car driving, f is the dynamics of the car, x is like the velocity and the position, and perhaps y I'll define as just the position because I may not be able to you know, get the velocity of the car from a single image, but I should reliably be able to predict the position of the car, let's say. Um, and then I can design a controller uh, based on all of these positions, the position history over time. Um, and so we have a block diagram that looks sort of like this, right? We have the car in the environment generates a state. The camera generates an image from that. By passing it through a perception component, we can then do sort of output feedback control. Um, and specifically, what I'll talk about here um, is a linear setting where we have linear dynamics. Um, so f is now a linear function. We have a complex observation model given by g, like I said, but we're going to reduce the complexity by saying that instead we actually observe some linear subset of the state, um, so for example, position, uh, plus some error, where these errors are now defined by you know, sort of the composition of appearance, perception um, minus off what I'm trying to predict, right? So this is, this is sort of true by definition if you plug these things back together. Um, 
but this is the way we're going to model it. And the reason that we're going to model it this way is because it looks sort of familiar where we have this sort of you know, idealized system and perception here, which looks simple. It looks like a linear control problem. Um, and then we have some perception error block that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so this is a familiar setting, like I was getting at, of uh, linear output feedback control. And this is well studied. I don't know how many of you have taken you know, control classes, but I'm sure you've seen these types of equations before. Um, and so depending on how we model the cost, how we model the process noise W, and how we model the measurement noise E, there's sort of well-studied solutions that we could do. Um, however, sort of maybe the most famous example of this would be the linear quadratic Gaussian controller. And so here we would model the process noise and the measurement noise as Gaussian, but remember our measurement noise is coming from this error in perception, so there's no real reason to believe it's Gaussian, so we're gonna have to do a little bit more thinking about this. Um, just an aside, but while I go forward, I'm really motivating this talk now with low-level control as the example. So in this situation, what I'm saying is that my car sort of designs a low-level controller to follow, for example, waypoints. So that you know, this star might be a waypoint, and I say, how are you going to control the motors to get to that waypoint? Uh, that's a very low-level task. And often, especially in robotics, when we think about how we might use a sensor like a camera, that's not really the task we're thinking directly about. We might be thinking something like, we already have a low-level waypoint following controller. We're not really using the camera for that. Uh, but uh, we follow waypoints based on some path planner. And you know, if we want to use the camera for that, we're really closing the loop in a different way. So, you know, instead of waypoints as like this a specific position, maybe we have a high level goal like drive and park in the corner. And this kind of goal would be fed into the system. Uh, and the camera would be used along with a perception and path planner to decide how to set up waypoints that would maybe bring me to park in the corner. Um, I, I bring this up just to say that although I will be motivating the rest of the talk with this waypoint tracking example, I want you guys to keep in mind that what I'm saying applies to sort of any system that has this perception to loop type of feedback, right? So anytime I'm using some learned component to make decisions about my system. Um, so with that said, um, I hinted at this before, but if I don't know the model of my errors, it's not 100% clear how to solve a linear optimal control problem. So the first thing we're going to talk about is now perception errors. So how do we learn this perception component? What do we do with images? Can we talk about generalization in this setting? Um, so for this talk, because I'm worried about the composition of these two pieces, I'm not focusing on the particulars of the perception map and how you learn it. What I would like to do is characterize a sufficient condition for stability. And that's what I'm going to get to in this section. I think there's a lot of interesting ways that you can uh, get at these properties that are m more specific to images, more specific to neural networks, or to visual odometry um, that I'll talk a little bit about at the end and that I'd love to talk about more afterwards. Um, but for this setting, let's just say we learn some map P from pairs of states and images. Um, and for simplicity, let's just assume that we actually have zero training data, training error, so that we sort of interpolate the training data. Um, if I've driven the car along this path and collected training data at these points, then if I try to drive it along the second path, I would maybe expect that it should still you know, be able to perceive its location pretty well. But if I start driving all the way in this other direction, probably not so much. Why would I believe that my perception map should continue working? Um, and so that motivates us to think about this safe set around training data. Um, as long as we stay near where the perception performs well, we can hope that it will perform well, um, which is kind of circular. But let's think about what does learning theory have to say about this? You know, machine learning talks a lot about you know, training set, testing set, errors, generalization. You know, is that going to help us here? So a quick intro, or quick, yeah, very quick whirlwind tour of what that has to say. So empirical risk minimization, this is not the only way to learn things, but it is probably the most common, is that I would find my perception map P by minimizing some loss function um, over all my data points. So all my data points, Z, I, X, I, these are states and observations, so like images, for example. Um, I minimize this loss function over what I've observed. Um, this is called empirical risk minimization. So, you know, the sum of the risk is, sum of the losses is my risk. It's empirical because I'm doing it over an empirical distribution. 
Um, but what I care about is something like the population risk. So not just what happens on the data I observe, but what happens from new data points drawn from some distribution. So the classic approach says that um, if I have a new data point drawn from the same distribution as my training points, um, I can define the empirical risk as that expected loss. And then my question is, you know, if my loss was sort of generally small on my training data, what will it look like on my testing data? Well, if I draw from the same distribution again, um, I can sort of write that my population risk is my empirical risk plus my population risk minus my empirical risk, right? Sort of very complicated expression here. Um, and then I can, since I said my training data was zero in this case for simplicity, I'm really just bounding things by this difference. Um, so the difference between you know, the two things, like I, the one thing I have, which is empirical risk, and the one thing that I care about, which is population risk. Um, in the nice case of you know, standard machine learning, these are an, this is an empirical distribution with a real distribution. Um, and because you know, lots of statistics over the years has done really beautiful analysis for us, we can say that actually empirical distributions approximate distributions uh, as n gets large, and we can maybe bound this value as 1 over square root n or something. So this is like what a learning rate would look like. This would make us happy, and it would say, get more data, we sort of get better. Um, but you know, we're not, when we control a system, we're not drawing new states randomly and asking how well our perception is going to perform. Um, so what happens if there's distribution shift? Like just because I you know, drove the car around a circle here and had low loss, what if I veer off into the center or something? Um, then I'm going to see a lot of data points that don't necessarily look so good, right? Um, so there are sort of ways to approach this um, from a statistical perspective that uh, look at sort of maybe the empirical risk over a new distribution d prime, where it will be a similar story to before, but now we're concerned about the distance between the two, distribu two distributions. Um, and you can define this as a statistical difference, um, but actually what I'm going to do moving forward is get away from statistics. It's not really helpful in this setting because I don't have random sampling. I don't have IAD data. What I have is something in feedback, um, but I am going to hold on to this idea of distribution shift. So uh, instead of statistical generalization, I'm going to think about maybe deterministic or adversarial generalization. Um, you know, like I said, the closed loop states, the distribution of states that I will see during operating my, while operating my system, depend on that perception map I train in the first place. Um, but I'm controlling the system. So I actually have some say in what distribution um, of states I might observe. And so the idea is to actually leverage the control authority to ensure closeness, right? Like make the car drive around this area where I think my errors are small or my loss is good. Um, and that, that is what I'm going to do. Uh, the question is, is this possible, right? So the one way to ensure this, um, at least from the perspective of your perception map and the errors that it has, um, is given by an idea of a slope, bound, a slope boundedness. So if the composition of my perception and my appearance map, so this is something that, you know, appearance is based on where you are in a room. So this might be like where all the chairs are, what colors they are, you know, very complicated. My perception map, I could look at visual features and sort of map them against a database of features and guess my position. Um, as I move, uh, the appearance map might be somewhat smooth, right? Like if I look this way and this way, there's not that much of a difference in what I see. But if something's really close to me, then maybe that's not so smooth. At the same time, the perception map right, is taking in images um, and predicting position. And so it's sort of this high dimensional input space usually we don't think of those functions as necessarily being smooth, right? And that's why things like adversarial images exist, um, or people have like, you know, really cute examples of like making a stop sign classifier think that it's something totally different. Um, and so that's not what I'm asking to guarantee in this situation. I'm not asking for the perception map itself to be smooth just for its composition with the real world to be smooth. So as long as you input real images that were generated, um, that should vary sort of smoothly. Uh, slope boundedness is just a little bit more general than smoothness, but you can think of this as like a Lipschitz smoothness condition. So as long as my errors satisfy this, which is sort of a reasonable thing you might hope perception maps to satisfy, um, then I have bounded errors around my training data, right? So as I move away from a training data point, my errors don't grow by too much. And S is the parameter that's going to control that. Um, and then I can use this to say, here's a set where the errors are small. Uh, this is 
very different from traditional generalization, but it might feel very natural to a control engineer, for example, um, defining a region that we believe is safe and that we would like to operate in. Um, and speaking of control, let's move sort of into that part of this argument. How do we, you know, have, we have an, a region that we think is safe, we have a map, we think we can perceive the world within that, that set. How do we actually make sure we stay in that set? How do we act within that set? So that's where robust control is going to come into play. So, like I said, our goal is to ensure that the system stays within the safe set despite the measurement error. So despite these perception errors, E, that I know I'm gonna have, uh, while potentially optimizing some performance, right? Our goal is to drive a car onto racetrack really fast. So we would like to sort of do all these things at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of approaches to this. So one really natural one, and the demo actually is based off of this kind of approach, is a model predictive control approach. So this is a receding horizon controller that sort of optimizes performance for some finite time horizon while satisfying certain constraints, um, and then sort of replans at every time step. This is super useful in practice, but unfortunately, it's a lot more difficult to get a handle on, you know, when am I going to guarantee that this controller is feasible? Um, and these types of arguments tend to be a little bit more loose. So I'm gonna make the argument using a different way to talk about uh, closed loop systems and robust control, which is called system level synthesis. Um, and this is a approach to controller design that looks at specifically the map from the process noise and the measurement errors, so these two error signals, to the states and the inputs of the system. So I sort of cover up everything that's happening inside, so instead of worrying about just the controller K, I sort of just worry about the whole response. Um, and so now I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction to this way of thinking about systems. I think it's really useful, and hopefully you'll see that by the end, why I think it's useful. Um, but yeah, so let's start with state feedback. So remember we're in the setting of output feedback because we don't actually see uh, you know, the world perfectly because we have this weird sensing modality. Um, but for the purposes of introduction, let's go back to state feedback. That's always a nice case, it's always an easy case. So in closed loop, the state and the input of a system are actually just a linear function of disturbances. To see why that's true, uh, remember that the state of the system is written in, can be written in terms of the inputs and the disturbances, right? This is by sort of unrolling that recursion. Um, but then, because we have a linear controller, well, okay, as long as you have a linear controller, this is true. Um, because we have a linear controller, we can also write the inputs as a function of the states, and if we put these two equations together and uh, you know, do some rearranging, um, we can actually just write the state and the input as directly functions of that disturbance. So, very transparent map between what goes into the system and what comes out. Um, and in what follows, I'm going to like sort of simplify notation a little bit by talking about sort of signals and operators. So instead of thinking about each xt, I'm going to think about sort of the sequence of all the x's. Um, it could be finite, it could be infinite. Um, notationally, it's not going to matter. I'm also going to think about the sequence of all the u's um, and the sequence of all the w's, the disturbances. So this thing here, this phi x phi u, that's sort of an operator that operates on these infinite horizon signals uh, and returns other sort of potentially infinite horizon signals. Um, you can, it's just a convolutional operator. It's sort of what you would get from stacking this expression into like this huge Toplitz matrix. Um, but notationally, that's all it means is something that operates on a noise signal and gives me my states and my inputs. Um, and so we can use this identity that I just sort of wrote down this linear relationship to derive um, a new optimal control problem. So remember my original optimal control problem, I have some cost. So okay, I'm gonna write things now in terms of linear quadratic control because that's where everything is easy to write. Um, if I minimize some quadratic cost um, subject to the dynamics and subject to the control being a linear function of the state, um, this is sort of the optimal control problem. And if I reformulate that in terms of signals, it doesn't look too different. It's actually more beautiful in my opinion because I don't have to write any subscripts, which is annoying to type. Um, but I have the same thing, right? So I sort of have this quadratic cost. I have these linear dynamic constraints um, and linear controller constraints. And you know, I might actually also have state and input constraints. Um, this is really realistic for um, something that you do in practice where you also don't want to crash the car into a wall, but you would actually like to stay on the track. Um, but if I know that my state and my input are just linear functions of the disturbance, I could rewrite this whole thing just in terms of 
uh, these system responses, so that linear function, and the disturbance. Um, and then I can actually take the expectation over the disturbance if I'm assuming it's noisy or whatever. Um, and I get this also very beautiful expression that has no subscripts. So in this case, I still have a quadratic cost, right? I'm still sort of doing this norm, norm minimization. Um, I still have some sort of like affine constraints A and B that are determining my dynamics. And I'm still going to have some sort of constraints on the system response that correspond to these. So there's sort of a nice translation between thinking about things in terms of states and inputs um, and a controller and feedback, and then thinking about the whole closed loop response as a single thing. Um, and that's what system level synthesis is. It's just a formalization of this kind of cute observation. Um, and it formally says that there is this correspondence. So if I design a system using that sort of optimal control problem I just showed you, as long as it lies in that affine space defined by A and B, um, there is a controller realization. Don't worry too much about the form. I can use the system response to design a controller that then achieves that exact response in closed loop, which is cool, right? Because usually when I think about what I would like a system to do, it's about how I would like it sort of to respond, how I would like it to react to these error signals. Um, and now I can design that directly. And as long as I constrain it in the right way, everything will be good. Um, so that's really nice. Why would I do that, though? I could just do normal optimal control. Well, the real reason that I'm interested in this personally, um, I think this since system level synthesis also has applications to things like distributed control. Um, but personally, my sort of reason for getting into this weird new optimal control, robust control framework um, is because of unknown dynamics. So if I'm designing you know, a controller, but I don't really know how the dynamics progress, I would instead have some A hat and B hat. And so I can you know, have some estimated x hat and u hat. And I think that's what's going to happen when I put things in closed loop. But um, I don't really know, because I'm planning in something totally different than what's going to happen. And it's not totally clear how to translate between these two things. Um, but the really nice thing is that in system response space, so I sort of lifted from signals into you know, transfer functions, um, if a system lies in the estimated dynamic space, so A hat and B hat space, I can actually sort of rearrange this equation and take a matrix inverse and find out that this weird looking system response lies in the A, B space. Um, and that's cool because this new weird looking response then tells me how my system will act in the presence of these additional errors in A and B. Um, and then there is like sort of a condition for this to be true, which is that uh, the norm of, so basically this inverse has to exist. And the way to guarantee that it would exist for any delta A and delta B is to constrain the estimated system response's norm to be less than, and sorry, this epsilon is the size of these errors delta A and delta B. Um, OK, so I have some equations on the board. I said suddenly I magically know how systems are going to act under these uncertainties, which seems unrealistic, because if I knew the uncertainties, I would have designed under them in the first place. Um, and that's totally true. Um, this is sort of an expression for how the true system will react to disturbances, even though I designed an estimated system. And I can write it down. Of course, this delta in this case is just this delta A delta B term. Um, I don't know what that is, right? I don't know what my errors in A and B are. I don't know what my, my estimation errors are, because if I did, then this wouldn't be a problem in the first place. But uh, this does give us something to work with, right? We can try to bound this quantity and think about how that uncertainty will affect how things propagate. Um, and that's exactly what we do. So um, just to sort of put this up again formally, right? If we design in the estimated space and we use that estimated controller, we get this sort of nice looking system response. Um, and uh, this has been really useful as a paradigm for analyzing learning and control by sort of transparently understanding how these not only like disturbances, but also the errors in estimation map to the closed loop behavior. Um, as a caveat, we're still in the state feedback setting. Um, eventually, we're going to get back to perception. We're going to get back to output feedback. But this has been most useful so far in the case of learning with state feedback. Um, and so we use system level synthesis. We use this robust control framework to understand how suboptimal a controller is with respect to those errors, so the dynamics estimation errors. And then we use statistics to bound the uncertainty of those errors as we get more data. And by putting these two things together, we can sort of get these full sample complexity bounds of how, do my, how does my controller act as I get more and more data. Um, and I've done this work sort of in the setting of 
a, a robust adaptive control. So this is sort of where you're in real time trying to both estimate and act optimally. And there's some trade-off between uh, you sort of exploring the system by injecting noise and exploiting the system by trying to design optimal controller. Um, and then I've also done this in the setting of learning while satisfying constraints, right? So I don't know the system. I need to excite it to learn something about it, but I also don't want to violate some safety constraints. I don't want to crash into a wall or whatever. Um, we can also analyze what learning looks like in that case um, using this framework. But uh, that's not actually what I'm talking about today, although I hope it motivated you to sort of stay with me through all that math. Um, today we're thinking about perception-based control. So, Right? We have a car, we have some safe set. What we're trying to say is, how can we make this car stay in the safe set? Um, and we have this system where asking the question of staying in the safe set is really asking, can I ensure that my X's stay safe despite these measurement errors that I know that I have? Um, so now we will get back to that. Um, output feedback, system level synthesis, looks very similar to state feedback. We just have a few more terms now. So. Uh, instead of just having two terms, we have four because we have two signals and then still states and inputs. Um, and we have this sort of same relationship between designing in an affine space and then achieving a response. Um, and I'm actually not going to go into the robust version of this for now because all I really want is this transparent map to my perception errors E, which I've got. So, all right, we're all good. Um, we sort of at least symbolically think we understand how our errors are going to propagate through to our states. And that gives us hope for saying that those states will stay safe. Um, and in fact, they do. So sort of just by writing the expression that I had on the previous slide um, and then thinking about our distance from training errors, um, if we do, uh, if we close the loop with the controller from a system response, um, then we can remain close to training data. So x minus xd is going to be the distance of our closed loop states from any state in the, training, in the training data set. It's bounded by sort of how much we plan to deviate from the training set, plus this extra term uh, that depends on a particular part of that system response. So this is the system response that maps measurement error to state. I mean, writing it down, it seems like true almost by definition, right? The size of the error times the map from error to state uh, is my additional error over my planned deviation from my training data. So this expression says, as long as this is true, you will stay near training data. Um, another way to look at this uh, that might be more appealing if you don't want to do linear control is that this is a condition that sort of lets me reason about set invariance um, of that set around my training data. Yes? So could you also rewrite this as a way of guiding your exploration to increase your support over uh, your training, training data? data? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So. Um, the one caveat for that in this setting is that um, because we have this observation framework where we're just seeing images during observation or during operation and we don't have additional state labels, the relearning thing, so like guiding exploration in this setting is a little bit subtle to talk about. Right? So, yeah, sorry, let me say that again. So, in supervised learning, we have labels and features. Our features here are the images, or like you know some featureized version of them. The labels are the states. And so uh, I probably glossed over this a little bit too much before, but I was assuming that we, during training, we have those labels. Um, which, when you then talk about an online setting of exploration exploitation, uh, suddenly that assumption seems a lot worse, because if you really had state observation for exploration, uh, then maybe you should just use that for control. But it still does actually say something about how you should design your training data, essentially. And if you could come up with an unsupervised method for updating your perception map, uh, where you only have access to images over time, which is actually a, one of the directions of future work that I'll mention, um, then this would exactly sort of uh, show you how you could sort of guide exploration at the edges of your safe set to add more points to the, to the safe set, exactly. Um, so yes that this kind of reasoning about what trajectories are going to happen could be used to then design trajectories um, that will give you more data. Um, okay, and then just one example in case anybody really loves um, LQG or something and wants to understand uh, what this slide means in terms of that system. So just to recall, like linear quadratic Gaussian problem, the optimal solution to that is a combination of static feedback on an estimated state with state estimation with like a static observer, right? So my estimated state, I run it through the dynamics, 
and I include an update term based on the real y that I observe from the system. And then I just use the estimated state to control the system. Um, in this case, we can actually like write out what is this, what is this map that I'm like saying exists that we need to control the norm of. This map from measurement error to state sort of has this form. You can see it depends on sort of A plus BK, so that's sort of like the uh, stability of the state feedback controller. A minus LC is the stability of the observer. Um, and this like BK term, you know, take a power of matrices, it looks kind of messy. Um, the takeaway that I want to point out is that having a large K and L here, there's sort of a trade-off, right? So K is how much you listen, how much you uh, control, how uh, large your controller response is to the estimated state. And L is how large your estimator response is to the observed output. In this case, if either of them are too small, you might not be stabilizing your system enough. And so these terms in the diagonal could be big, right? If A is like close to unstable. On the other hand, uh, this term and this term both have a, a K and an L in them. So if K and L are too large, then you're also very sensitive. So there is some sweet, sweet spot in terms of being responsive enough to the system that, it, that you can maintain like stability, um, but not being too responsive. So you know, this expression looks kind of ugly, um, and that's like why I like to work in the system responses, but just to give a little bit more intuition for maybe what I'm saying when I talk about this map. All right, so. Uh, all right, I dragged everybody through generalization and machine learning. I dragged everybody through robust control. Um, what was the point? So the point is so that I can say this. Um, under sort of the previous assumptions of the last two lemmas that generalization implies closeness and closeness implies generalization lemmas, um, as long as I have this sort of sensitivity, sensitivity bound, so the sensitivity of the system to measurement errors is bounded by the slope uh, constant of my perception errors, then we have that the closed-loop trajectory is within the state safe set, and the perception errors are bounded in a way that depends on a bunch of different things, the measurement sensitivity, uh, sorry, measurement sensitivity, the planned deviation from the training data, and the slope bound. Uh, yes? Can you be like adversarial about measurement sensitivity and like test whether or not like... Yeah, so I guess I'll say that all of these, these conditions are true even under adversarial errors, but they require sort of the assumption of a slope bound that holds no matter what. So any, like, regardless of how you try to be as adversarial as possible with measurement errors, as long as they satisfy sort of a smoothness around training data, then you're safe. On the flip side, the fact that this is potentially true even under adversarial errors means that it is probably pretty conservative. And that's like a thing in robust control that is constantly true, and there's always a trade-off. And there's definitely room to sort of bring a slightly more statistical perspective in to like loosen that up a little bit. Um, but, and actually, yeah, in talking about sort of adversarial and worst case situations, I do actually have an example, I think, in like a slide or two. Um, but before I get there, let me just, uh, looking at the, the guarantees of this theorem, um, what they're really saying is that as long as I have this sort of limited measurement sensitivity, um, then I have set invariance around my training data. That's sort of the high level takeaway. Um, and that high level takeaway, I think, is something that can be applied more generally to even nonlinear systems. All right. Um, so, okay, cool. Uh, I can specialize this result to sort of a reference tracking task. Um, to give a little bit more intuition for what these things mean. I'm going to go a little bit faster with this because I want to have plenty of time to show videos. Um, essentially, if my reference tracking task is sort of the difficulty of it is controlled by the distance between two waypoints that I'm trying to track, as well as the distance from waypoints to training data, then the perception errors are bounded as long as this whole thing is less than one. Um, so what is this saying? Well the S and this distance from my referent, uh, distance from my training data, those are about the quality of my perception map and the sort of coverage of my training data. So the more training data I get, the smaller this distance would be and the better my perception map, the smoother, sort of like more adapted to the setting, the smaller this S would be. Um, on the other hand, uh, the delta ref and the deref are both measures of how difficult the task is. So we sort of see this in this expression uh, something that is illustrative about how training data and learning can limit your ability to sort of achieve difficult tasks. 
um, because this whole thing has to be bounded by one. Uh, there's also two terms here that depend on your design system response. Um, so you can try to make these terms small, but eventually they can't both be zero um, because these are sort of terms that lie in this affine space, and so you can't infinitely make them small. So the system itself is going to have some limits there. Um, I'm not going to talk a ton about this, only to say that um, with the adversarial question before, I sort of said, you know, any, um, any errors, the system will be safe as long as it satisfies these conditions. Um, but that obviously could be very conservative. This example is just to say that there are some systems and some type of errors where it's actually not a conservative condition. It's sort of an if and only if condition, where if I have this sort of particular position, position miscalibration in the perception map, then if I don't constrain the controller uh, in this way under synthesis, I will be unstable, and otherwise I won't be unstable. Um, yeah. Now I get to go to the demos, which is what I am rushing towards. So first I'm going to talk about a simulated setting. Um, here we're using Carla, which is just like an open source simulator where you can sort of generate street views um, and pretend to drive a car. Uh, we're not actually using any fancy car dynamics. For this setting, we're using this like hovercraft dynamics, we call it, which is a 2D double integrator. So we assume we have perfect control over x and y position. Um, and we're going to look at two different types of perception maps. Uh, I hinted at this before, but one is um, visual odometry, where my perception map simply featurizes an image and then looks up in a database images that sort of match that image, and then I do a special like geometric transformation um, between the features in both images to try to figure out how far I am from the other image. So it's kind of like nearest neighbors plus some geometry to give you something very good that works really well in robotics. Um, and the training method here is sort of a simultaneous location, uh, localization, and mapping algorithm. Um, we use OrbSlam, and there's only 200 points in the training set. So I'm kind of doing nearest neighbors on 200 points with special geometry. Um, on the other hand, we did like a very simple uh, convolutional neural network, which was just single layer, had ReLUs and a max pool, and we trained this one with 30,000 points. Um, it took a lot more. But to be fair, it also had no special geometric structure or anything else. Um, and our simulation results, the goal here was to find something that might fail without special tuning, and that sort of adding this robustness condition to would sort of fix that, right? Because we're trying to look for failures to understand when they occur. Um, in the visual odometry setting, if you look down here, this is how far we are from our reference trajectory. Uh, one second. We are uh, mostly doing really well. And the reason we're doing so well, you can kind of see, is that our perception errors as a function of distance from the training data are like pretty small. They're very nicely slope bounded. Sort of, if I really don't move too far away from training data, they stay quite small. Um, on the other hand, the neural network did not sort of like have these as nice properties. To be clear, like our goal was, we're not experts, our goal was not to make this work super well. I don't, okay, I do kind of want to come away from this saying that maybe like slam and visual odometry are good and neural networks are bad, but that's, we didn't do enough work to really say that. Uh, we just got something that kind of worked. It really did not work very well if we just had these nominal controllers that didn't account for potential sensitivities, um, but it did work if we sort of constrain the controller to act in a very smooth way with respect to these fairly large uh, errors. Um, any questions? Yeah. What were like failures in your case? Like, is that the, the like, is that just like the distance or the, like the- The distance from the reference trajectory is sort of what we're measuring as quality in this case. Um, I can show you the example, actually what a failure looks like for, um, for this is the visual odometry. Um, so really in this case, failure occurs um, because we fail to match. So we sort of like fail to find the right features. We fail to match something in the database. And then, right, like in this method, we just like drive forever into the distance. And because it's a simulator, we drive through buildings and stuff. Um, something similar happens with the neural network, except that it's not quite as parsable because we just sort of have this black box method that's telling us position based on image. Um, so. Um, I have a little bit of time left, so oh, I actually I'm okay on time. Um, I have time left, so then I will I will now show that this also works sort of in practice at least um, to do iterative racing on arbitrary tracks. In this case, the first lap is a human demonstration 
of the track shape. The second uh, two laps are PID control, just reference following around that first lap to gather more data. Um, and also, um, during the first lap, we sort of do mapping. Um, and then during the second laps and all the preceding laps, we just do localization. The rest of the laps, uh, and I think in this case there's like maybe 30 of them, we use this iterative learning MPC strategy, which was developed by some people at Berkeley, um, Ugo Rosalia and Francesco Borelli. Um, and this allows the car to sort of drive faster um, after each lap by using data from previous laps. Um, what's special about this method for MPC is that the terminal cost, so MPC I mentioned before, it's a receding horizon strategy. We have a finite control problem, finite time control problem that is replanned at every time step. So uh, the, because it's finite, the terminal cost sort of matters a lot. If I'm pl planning over a sort of short horizon uh, and you know there's a wall like 10 steps in front of me, but I'm only planning two steps. If I don't sort of plan correctly, I might end up running into the wall. So this terminal cost matters a lot, as does the terminal constraint set. And by updating that with data from previous laps, you can sort of get really nice behavior where a car, for example, learns to cut corners and drive faster. So this is a little illustration of the car. Um, the red is the planning horizon, and the green is sort of this safe set that we're planning to reach, the terminal set that we're reaching. Um, and I point that out because I'm going to show you the video now, um, which just demonstrates what I just told you was going to happen. So in this case, human, the human is driving the car with the joystick around this track pretty slowly because we're not very good at driving. The rope is actually only there for us to see the track. It's not really one of the visual features that's used. And, um, you can see here from what the camera is observing, the rope is not a huge part of that. Um, we're mostly seeing like the chairs, the wall. Um, specifically, what we're using for localization here is these, are these features, these key points that are mapped against and matched against some database from our first lap. Um, and that is what is used throughout for the remaining laps. Now, in this experiment, we're actually no longer updating our sort of perception training data. We're not updating that initial database. Um, in practice, we find that driving faster and updating the database at the same time uh, sort of lead to failures in a weird way that we're thinking about understanding. Um, you could imagine an iterative thing where you learn, uh, you add to your training data more sort of midway through. Um, but even without that, uh, we still do learn to drive much faster after about 20 laps. So you can see here, even our planned trajectories, there's much more space between these points. We're planning to drive much faster. Um, and at this point, the dashboard camera does look pretty like fast. You know, it's not crazy. Um, we have actually have a little bit of a faster demo now with better tuning on the camera. Um, but we can mostly detect these key points, although we do have lapses in them as we move fast because of the fast movement of the camera. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about and just point out as I wrap up, is that this example just illustrates how we end up being limited by the perception strategy that we have. So um, as performance improves, the control task becomes more difficult. So um, this MPC strategy is not a waypoint tracking problem, but it is sort of analogous to a waypoint tracking problem where we adaptively choose our waypoints. Um, in the beginning, we saw you know, the little drawing with something like this, where we have a car with a fairly short planning horizon. Uh, this safe set that we're trying to reach is fairly close to the car, um, sort of like an easy task. But as the car drove a lot faster and got the performance that we're excited about, um, the planning horizon is much longer, and we're now planning to reach a safe set that is much further away. Um, and so if we make this analogy to waypoint tracking, the waypoint that we're trying to reach uh, sort of becomes much further becomes much further away from the car. So that's sort of our delta ref example. So how far away is the waypoint that we're trying to reach? Um, and it also moves away from the training data. Uh, like I said, the training data is just from the center line of the track. And so as we cut corners, we're also moving away potentially from that. And so for this reason, we see that we're sort of pushing more against the limits of what we would expect the system to be able to do safely. Um, and so. That's sort of suggestive. I have not yet fully closed the gap between this demo and some of the theoretical work around why it would or wouldn't work, and that's ongoing stuff now. But just to say, um, the key takeaways I'd say are that a system can safely operate near its training data, um, and that by leveraging control authority, you can sort of sidestep issues of distribution shift. And 
really what this means, in other words, is that we can construct an invariant set around training data as long as the designed closed loop system satisfies a stability property. Um, there's a lot of directions I think that you can take this work forward with. One um, is an extension to receding horizon control or nonlinear dynamics. I have throughout tried to pepper in the phrases that might apply in those settings, but the work to actually formally do that has not been done yet. Um, the second one that I uh, hinted at a little bit earlier is unsupervised learning, right? If we're operating the car in real time, um, and we don't have access to new labels of what state I'm at, how do I actually get better? So the SLAM method, the localization method that I showed, actually is semi-unsupervised um, because we don't have ground truth. We don't have a Vicon setting there. Um, so sort of formalizing that and thinking about how you can use that adaptively would be really interesting. Um, and then lastly is this tighter coupling between uh, perception and dynamics. Um, for like learning and for operation to sort of get even better, better performance. Um, and so with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. Um, these are some of the references throughout the talk. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you had so I didn't see any dependency on uh, Leyland variable, which would represent the map, for example. Or z, z, you mean? Yeah, something like this. Like the, the, the like camera image itself, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. So how, how is it that the, because in the setting where you have slam, it depends on how the scene is illuminated and things like this. Yeah. Yeah, or, so that, that's a great point. All of that is sort of pushed into this idea of a slope bound, essentially. Um, in other words, like the slope bound is sort of the sufficient thing you need to characterize the closed loop behavior, but you're, you're totally right. So one of the future directions actually is that, um, you know, if you use SLAM to map a region, you have some database essentially of frames with key points. And these are three dimensional points. And so you can look back at those points that you've mapped and say like, if I'm in any particular spot in the room, will I see, do I expect to see enough points to then match in the database? And that would be one sort of like, uh, not like one way to characterize that slope bound and to characterize a safe set that would like heavily rely on the structure of SLAM, if that makes sense. Uh, that would encode things like if the light on one side of the room is really bright, and this is actually an issue we run into if we don't get uh, the good conference room at night, um, is that the camera just has the auto exposure can't keep up, and so there are parts of the space where we don't have good features, we don't have good images, and if you sort of look at the map constructed by SLAM, you see that. Um, so it's all in the slope bound, and I think there's work to be done to sort of tease that out a little bit more. Yeah. But so over time, if, the, if, if you train your system at, during the day and you deploy it at night, do you have to forget all of the system and recompute the balance? Yeah, so in this case, I'm really talking about like uh, interpolation and like staying around training data and non-varying environments. So like what you said is true, like nothing, I mean nothing that I formally wrote applies in that case. Um, SLAM, because it sort of uses features in geometry in a particular way that is more invariant to lighting changes, as long as the camera exposure matches, maybe would work. Um, and I think that's definitely interesting. Yeah. Uh, what are the like, prospects for using this framework uh, for a nonlinear system? Um, so one prospect that apparently is true, although I don't personally know of it, um, is that the, so the people who sort of invented or like SLS as a way of looking at systems are all at Caltech and I visited a few weeks ago and they told me that it all parses for nonlinear systems as well. So like the expressions that I wrote about like sort of operators would apply for nonlinear operators. So that's like the you know, easy answer. Um, the hard answer is that like even though the expression might apply, the computation would not apply anymore. So it's not 100% clear how this, what this says for synthesizing. Um, Nonlinear controllers for nonlinear systems, but I think you could use some like set invariance ideas. And I'm like really not a nonlinear control expert at all, um, but I think there are some set invariance ideas like control barrier functions. I, I think Aaron was here last week and probably talked about them. Um, he tried to convince me that that would help in this setting, and maybe it will. So um, I think that's like one of the approaches. Anything around set invariance, basically. What about this question, uh, in your case, you have uh, everything is nonlinear with your SLAM algorithm, right? So how did you apply the algorithm to match your framework on the car? 
Yeah. Have you linearized everything, or how did you do it? So, yeah, so, I mean, percept yeah, the slam itself is nonlinear, perception is nonlinear, that's fine for the framework. It's the dynamics being nonlinear that doesn't totally match. Um, we do, like, MPC, like receding horizon control, and so we linearize the dynamics for each of those receding horizons, actually. Um, and so we actually haven't done this yet, but the plan is to actually implement that sort of norm sensitivity constraint in a receding horizon version of the SLS framework, essentially. Um, and we're hoping that that, I mean, it's a trade-off between sort of like over robu overly robust and like actually helping, so that's something that we're working on now. Yeah, another question. Okay. So how does the robustness problem guarantee to like other like system response parameterizations, like maybe with the UO parameterization? Yeah, so I, the, yes, yeah, so the like phi xe, that like measurement noise to state map, um, I think you can write an equivalent EULA expression. Like if you sort of like go, there's a relationship between system responses and controllers, and there's a relationship between controllers and EULA, and so I think there's definitely connections that you could write an expression in terms of a EULA parameter that would apply. Um, and it actually, it, it's possible it would be fairly simple in this case, although I'm not sure if it would like look nice or not. Yeah. Cool, that takes us to 12, so let's bang our speaker.